Football on off the ball with William Hill. Who you got? 18 plus. See gamblingcare.ie. Now you're very welcome back to the second hour of tonight's off the ball. Delighted to say we've got Gavin Cooney with us in the 42 OE. Gavin, how are you getting on? Well, what's the crack? All we, good here. We were trying to debate last hour, and Michael McCarthy couldn't be drawn on it. Do you get excited about the Community Shield? No. No, I don't. And I, I'll tell you why I don't. I felt, I got, I looked forward to last season's one and then it fe- it really let us down. If you were to go on by just like in terms of the Community Shield predicting the season, last season we saw Darwin Nunez score and Erling Haaland miss a sitter and Liverpool beat Man City. So you're thinking, well, Liverpool edged City to the league this year and this Haaland guy looks a flop. All in on Darwin Nunez. Um, didn't quite work out that way, did it? So, no, uh, no, I, uh, I've decided there's enough football on I'm going to take this weekend off Fair well hopefully you're going to watch a little bit of football over the weekend because we were taking a look at the championship fixtures a bit earlier on as well and straight away we we're thinking there's a lot of Irish players possibly with different roles albeit we'll talk about some of the Irish players who've transferred into the Premier League there's actually a better representation uh, than last season but we even think about uh, tonight's game with Southampton against Sheffield Wednesday and we look at how important this year is for Irish goalkeepers and for Gavin Bazunu, who I guess by his own admission had a tough season last year in the Premier League but he'll really be hoping to kind of rebuild his game time now back in the Championship Yeah I mean he had a couple of seasons on loan in League 1 with Rochdale and then with Portsmouth uh, Will before Southampton took the punt on him that he was ready for the Premier League last season don't know if you can talk in grand strokes as to whether he was ready or not the reality was he was in, a, in an inexperienced and just simply a bad team and they were relegated. Bazoon then was dropped for the last, what, six or seven games of the season after uh, that Arsenal game in which he so prodigiously uh, wasted time and helped to put a dent in Arsenal's title challenge. That was a kind of a fig leaf dropping, I have to say. They were no better when Alex McCarthy came in and they were as a result dropped. So there was a huge focus and scrutiny on Bazunu last season, as you would expect, because you're in the Premier League um, you're on TV every week. You're fighting at the wrong end of the league. And there's a reason why very few Premier League teams have 20 and 21-year-olds starting for them in goal. It's a very challenging and demanding position. Bazunu wasn't helped, I think, by Jamie Carragher's earn, and on Monday Night Football. That's like the flagship football show in England now, isn't it? Um, and arguably in Ireland as well. And the only bit of analysis they gave to Southampton at the back end of last season was to look at the expected goals, conceded number of Gavin Bazunu. Uh, and it said that the expect the goals that went in were significantly higher uh, by 12 or so than the expected goals conceded. And as a result, Carragher uh, concluded that Bazuna was a big problem for them. So I don't think he was the only reason why Southampton went down last season. But it would also be patronising to him to say to say anything other than his performances fell short of the ability that we've seen in when he's been playing for Ireland, like his performances bar maybe the concession of long range goals against um, Armenia last autumn has broadly held up. So this is a chance I think for him to drop down to the championship. It's the, you know, there's a softer glare of those of the, uh, Sorry, the limelight is a softer glare in the championship, doesn't it? It looks like he'll be first choice under uh, under his new manager, Russell Martin. Martin is, is really committed to passing out from the back. His Swansea side played more passes than anyone else in the championship last season. So you'd imagine the uh, manager style will suit him. And it's just a chance, Will, to rebuild a bit of confidence. You know, like he's only 21, I think. Uh, it is my firm opinion, and I think it will be the opinion of most fair-minded Irish fans, that Bazzini is still good enough to play at Premier League level and at the top level and he's only 21 like he's he's got a lot of time for all that to come so um he's on he is actually going to be on tv tonight isn't he away to sheffield wednesday on sky but uh it is a chance just for him to play twice a week uh, and get a bit of confidence back up yeah and even when his confidence was low last season Stephen Kenny continued to pick him for Ireland in the competitive games he gave a bit of time to Cuevin Kelleher but generally around the friendlies so Gavin Bazunu has been uh, the Republic of Ireland's first choice goalkeeper on Kelleher are you a little bit surprised he didn't look to move this summer I know there's still a few weeks left in the window but at the moment it looks like Kelleher is still going to be there as Alisson's backup for this season well, Stephen Kenny was convinced in June that this uh, this move away from Liverpool was going to happen and we saw there were a few tentative links with other clubs 
Brighton and Brentford being the obvious ones but uh, while they have sold or looked like they're selling their goalkeepers Sanchez has left Brighton to go to Chelsea David Raya is kind of they're negotiating with Arsenal for David Raya both have recruited goalkeepers uh, so Keller is not going to go there and all of their links have gone pretty quiet um, and even when Stephen Kenny w- was speaking in, in June around that international window saying he expected Keller to, to go out on loan he was at odds with Jurgen Klopp not for the first time uh, because Klopp said uh, that he didn't expect Keller to go and that it would take a, a heck of a lot of money for him to leave so it does look like once again he'll he'll spend a season as Alison Becker's deputy Alison is, is I think without doubt the best goalkeeper in the Premier League and maybe the best goalkeeper in the world the Ribble season was bad last year and would have been a hell of a lot worse had Alisson not been in goals so it looks like the, you know, the cycle is going to repeat itself for Kelleher for another year the only imponderable this year is that Liverpool are not in the Champions League so will will Kelleher be given the Europa League game so that'll be we won't really know how Liverpool are approaching that until the group stages kick off so maybe he'll get a little bit more game time there and you'd imagine he'll, he'll continue playing the Carabao Cup but um, yeah so I, it, it did seem like there was growing momentum behind a loan move or sorry not a loan move a permanent move away from Liverpool this year but they just had Liverpool has such an overhaul to do and they're still doing it that I suppose they didn't fancy going looking for a, for a substitute goalkeeper Kelleher's always been pretty consistent on his approach to this too where he feels genuinely he's developing at Liverpool he's playing behind some of the best players in the world he's learning from Alisson on a daily basis but in a way that kind of made more sense in 2018, 2019 when he was first being asked about this there is always that risk that in his mid-20s his development could stall from just a lack of competitive football yeah, look, I mean, he's probably he's too good to be sitting on Liverpool's bench. Unfortunately, like he would, he would definitely do a job for most teams in the Premier League, from like you know Aston Villa down, maybe even for the likes of Aston Villa or Brighton. Not that they're necessarily looking for a, a goalkeeper anymore. Definitely Villa, definitely Villa aren't. Um, so yeah, like I mean, yeah, he's probably been there a little bit too long. But look, he. He's also he's not been held there against his will. Like he did sign a, a longer term contract. Like since he was first asking the questions that you point out there, well, he has put pen to paper on a new deal at Liverpool. He's presumably pretty comfortable there and pretty happy there. I'm sure it's a nice work environment, a nice place to walk into. I I, I did get a sense from him that he he wanted a little bit more first wanted regular first team football, um, and he definitely needs it to break into the Ireland team because Bazunu has committed his in what his whole career he's been playing since he, he's only twenty one. But Bazunu has always been uh, has always accentuated the fact that I don't care what I'll get to the highest level I can while playing uh, regularly. And Mark Travers has now left uh, Bournemouth to go on loan to Stoke. Presumably to to play uh, to re- to play regular first team football there. So Keller is now the odd man out of the Irish trio and still on the bench. Like like Stephen Kenny's a massive fan of him, and if he was playing regularly, I think he would he would push Bazuna for the number one jersey. I think, but while he's on the bench at Liverpool, he won't be doing that. Stephen Kenny will probably be happy with some of his defenders particularly getting moves into the Premier League or across to teams in the Premier League where they're likely to play a little bit more. I mean, on the face of it, this move to Burnley for Darrow Shea looks a pretty good fit, doesn't it? Yeah, so and I'm, I'm, we're wondering now if he's going to be first choice in the Burnley defence, the Premier League. He started the last couple of preseason games, so you know perhaps perhaps he will be. And it looks a great move. I mean, Burnley of the teams coming up, you would imagine that Burnley are pretty well equipped to stay up. You'd imagine like they were just so impressive last season. They they just strolled to the title, and Vincent Company. Obviously, a very promising manager, and I think he had offers to move away from Burnley even prior to uh, prior to this pre-season. But he's obviously going to at least stick it out turf more for the first season. So, I mean, that's a great move. Again, you think you know sometimes when you put on your green tinted glasses, do we overrate these players because we just pay more attention to them? And definitely in this side of the water, these are the players, the Premier League players and the Championship players we see in the flesh just by virtue of, of the fact that they play here for Ireland. But I think you know the broad consensus is that O'Shea has the qualities to step up to that level. He had a kind of a pretty important leadership role, wore the captain's armband at West Brom. Uh, they kind of needed to sell him, I think, as much for financial reasons as anything else. So um, that's, that's a great move for him, you know, and like our Irish involvement in the Premier League has been dwindling. It was at a record low at the end of the season before last, uh, but that low was then further outstripped by the low it hit at the end of the most recent season. So it looks like maybe um, by virtue of some of the players that have uh, been promoted and a couple of the moves, like the one for, of O'Shea to Burnley, we might see that uh, those uh, total accumulated minutes for Irish players in the league um, tick upwards for the first time in a while. Quite a percentage of those games could be coming at Burnley, given that Josh Cullen is there and that Ob- 
Obafemi eventually got his move. Now, I'm not sure how much Obafemi is going to play, but Josh Cullen is going to be fairly central, you would think, to their team. Yeah, I mean, he is the brain. Josh Cullen is the brain of these Vincent Company teams. I mean, the, one of the great transfer wise, one of the great success stories for an Irish player in the last couple of years was Josh Cullen uh, trading England for Belgium and going to Anderlecht, um, where Company took over. And then one of Company's first acts when he took the Burnley job was to bring Cullen with him. So he's been his kind of metronome in midfield. It's very exciting to see how Cullen does when he steps up to the Premier League. You'd imagine he should do just fine. The big disappointment for Ireland in the most recent window was that Cullen was was not at it, really. Like, I mean, he, he struggled in midfield and his performance level wasn't what we've seen previously for Ireland. But yeah, I mean, you'd imagine that he should be... Um, he hasn't played a lot in pre-season lately. I actually didn't... I don't know whether he's been injured or not. We need to uh, get a bit further clarity on that. But um, just, just judging by the amount of faith that company has placed in him up until now you'd imagine that he'll uh, he'll continue to to build that Burnley midfield around him. Plenty of headlines during the week about potentially Omobama Delhi going to Milan. So Carl Heffernan is about to leave Milan. Potentially another Irish defender could go there. Um, they have an unusual recruitment system in Milan over the last couple of years. Uh, normally you would think this is quite a bizarre headline, but uh, it's not unbelievable that it might happen. No, not at all. Um, and it seems like, well, he's going to start. The, I thought that Milan thing was going to happen a few weeks ago and then it lost a little bit of its momentum, seemingly. So, Mama Bamadeli will start the season in Norwich as to whether he'll still be there at the end of August. We'll have to, we'll have to wait and see. But, Again, you have to remember that these Irish players have been given the platform of international football uh, to uh, to show what they can do as well. I mean, that's one of the reasons why Southampton backed Bazunu to, to start uh, to start last season. Um, Bam Adeli is we, like we've seen him when he's been fit for Ireland. Unfortunately, he's been injured too often. I think from from Ireland's point of view, we've just seen his quality, his quality on the ball, his pace. Yeah, his comfort in bringing the ball into midfield like he is he's kind of your ultra modern centre back isn't he so it's not I don't think it's shocking that he's uh, associated that he's linked with AC Milan to be honest they've recruited from the British market reasonably well in the last couple of years uh, so we'll have to see uh, wait and see obviously uh, obviously what happens there but you'd imagine that he should be he, he would anyway at least be confident that he could hold he could um, he could um, perform at that level Wolves were here last weekend to play against Celtic at the Aviva. Uh, we got to see a bit of Joe Hodge. We got to see a tiny bit of Matt Doherty. Um, but focusing on Doherty, obviously we've spoken about this before on the show, that his move to Atletico Madrid on the face of it looked very exotic and interesting. And then it didn't amount to a whole lot of game time. From his point of view, I guess he's hoping to get back to the level he was at at Wolves previously, albeit in this case in a slightly different system and with a different manager to when he left. You'd imagine it'll be a back four under Lapetegui now. I mean, that was the that was the change that that he made um, when he took over from Bruno Lage midway through last season. Uh, Darty's back. The Atletico thing didn't work out. He, he at the time he, he put a positive spin on it and said that look, it's a, it's a good experience to experience a new culture and learn from Diego Simeone and you know sit in a dressing room and, and learn from the likes of Griezmann and so forth. But he's behind um, Molina, the Argentinian uh, right back who won the World Cup in December. He was behind him in the pecking order and hardly got any game time at all, like a collection of, of, of a handful of minutes here and there. So that didn't work out at all. Tr- treated pretty appallingly by Spurs, you'd have to say. Uh, shipped out and loan and then Spurs realised that, hang on, there's new FIFA rules limiting the number of loan players we can have out. So sorry, Matt. Uh, thanks for everything, but goodbye. Um, so they basically ripped up the contract. So he's come, he's come full circle, and now he's back at Wolves. And I think the worry for Wolves fans, and, and the worry for anyone hoping that Darty can recapture his form there, is that 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 does not seem to be a particularly happy place to be at the moment. Darty gave a pretty honest interview, as is his uh, mo, um, by the side of the pitch at the Aviva last weekend, and said, "Look." everything behind the scenes is not what it should be really because they've been limited financial fair play wise they've been limited in what they can do they've brought Doherty and they've hardly brought anyone else in they've also you know Raul Jimenez has not been scoring the goals at the rate that he used to score them for Wolves but they sold him as well so they're short on goals they're short on attacking options they you know they they had to they pulled away from the relegation zone in the last few weeks of last season but like they've done nothing in the transfer window suggest to suggest anything other than they'll be battling against relegation again this year. And they've obviously lost 
captain uh, and heartbeat Ruben Neves to to the Saudi Pro League as well. So it's it's probably Darley's going back to Wolves now, but it, it's you know it's familiar surroundings, but it's going to be different for him. He'll probably be a right back in a back four, and it's not the upwardly mobile team we saw under Nuno Espirito Santo. It's now it's Lopetegui kind of trying to work his magic with a under very strange and limited resources uh, to try and stay in the league. Yeah, and Nathan Collins, one of those players who's left the club this summer as well, which I think was understandable his move across to Brentford when really he kind of got frozen out for the second half of the season. Again, he's one of those players, a bit like Bazunu, where even though he wasn't playing, say, in the Premier League, was still consistently picked for his country. But he, I'm sure he'll be relishing a new chance at a new club next season. Yeah, it's. I was kind of surprised initially to see that Wolves were happy to move on from him after only one season but I think just their financial constraints partly explain it like they are quite limited in what they can do FFP wise and Brentford were offering what 20 million odd for uh, for Collins and they've obviously bet the house on on Max Kilman o- over Collins at Wolves so um, it is an interesting move for Collins you'd imagine that it'll be a back three again this season for Brentford they'll be without Ivan Tony for the first half of the season but you'd be surprised if they end up doing such, such surgery on the team that they end up with a back four so the more of these players that are playing in a back three at a high level the more it suits Ireland because obviously that's the system that Ar- um, that Ireland suits so um, Collins is obviously a regular under uh, under Bruno Lage and ultimately frozen out under under Lapetegui much to his um Disappointment, uh, and I think he was disappointed by the fact that he just had to talk about it every time he sat down with us around Ireland camp. He was thoroughly sick of answering questions about it because the guy just wants to to play as often as he can. So um, there's not been much of an Irish influence at Brentford, really, has there, since uh, they came into the Premier League? So it's going to be super interesting to see how he goes. You'd imagine it will suit him, um, but you'd imagine that again, it's been a, it's been a constant upward trajectory for Brentford since they came into the Premier League dealing without Tony for the first half of the year is going to be difficult for them you have to imagine so you just you just hope that you know we, when Collins went to Wolves you're thinking this is a kind of a comfortably mid-table side uh, who you know might push on for fringes of Europe maybe have a have a bit of a shot at qualifying for the Conference League you, you think that Brentford are in the same position but maybe the Tony situation would make you think twice and think actually is Collins just actually going to end up in a similar similar spot again mm, Yeah, hard to repeat what Brentford achieved last season as well Jadossi Ogbeni though getting back into the Premier League once he became a free agent or it was clear he was going to become a free agent uh, this looks a good move and it's going to be interesting to see where he plays I would think at Luton he'll probably be playing as a conventional right winger but his versatility could well see him play at wing back or further back as well Ah, brilliant move for him, isn't it? I mean, like it's some of the like if you've seen him play for Limerick and play for Cork, and you're wondering, it's kind of that's sometimes hard to believe that this guy will end up in the Premier League in a few years' time. But it's a testament, it's a testament to his work ethic um, and obviously his quality and his talent. He's now a Premier League player with Luton, so that, it's a great, great story. As to where he'll play, yeah, you'd imagine that it would be as a conventional right winger, um, and he will have the pay, because let's face it, Luton will be playing a lot of this season on the counter attack. So um, Ogbeni's um, Pace suits him there. Uh, pace, sorry, will will suit them uh, for that purpose. But you know, he ha- he has a tactical intelligence and a flexibility and a work ethic that will make him a dream for Rob Edwards. And we saw it against France for Ireland. Like he was a kind of a, a, a pseudo right back helping Coleman out with uh, Mbappe occasionally in that game, and then had the pace to attack. Theo Hernandez and cause him all kinds of trouble didn't he so um, that flexibility probably made him appealing to Rob Edwards so super uh, good signing for Luton great story for, for Chiriozzi Ogbeni um, and obviously great news for Ireland because the more players uh, that Ireland have that are perf- that are competing week in week out at the highest level uh, the better the better for the team Ireland's best performer in the English top flight last year was clearly Evan Ferguson particularly the second half of the season that he put in the winds of change have been there at Brighton and Hove Albion to an extent we'll see if Caicedo is still there at the end of the window Alexis McAllister has left but I'm sure they were looking at Ferguson as one of their prized assets they wouldn't have wanted to lose this summer no, and they've signed him to another contract. I mean, last season, Ferguson was signing contract renewals at the rate the previous Irish strikers used to score in the Premier League. I think he two in a season. Like, I mean, we used to be happy with that in terms of a goal return in the post Robbie age. Uh, so, uh, so it's going to take a a whopping amount of money to get Ferguson out of Brighton when the time comes um, so yeah this is, it's pretty exciting isn't it I mean I think it's was it six goals out of ten starts last season the age of 18 like at that rarefied level 
that's that's like that's sensational. Um, so the hope now is he'll kick on. Um, he hasn't been regularly starting in preseason. I did see one or two tweets from fretting Irish fans being like, "Oh, should we we be worried about this?" Because uh, they've signed Joe Pedro from uh, from Watford, and I see Danny Welbeck is, is still there. But there'll be lots of chances to play at Brighton this season because they're in the Europa League group stages. There's going to be rotation. And you would imagine if he stays injury free, that Ferguson will remain first choice. The great thing about landing at Brighton is that they also managed his minutes last season. Mm-hmm. Uh, they like they did kind of they did everything that they they generally did the right thing by him, which was great and just kind of underlines what a great move uh, that was for him. So um, you'd imagine that a target, a realistic target for him now should be to get to double figures in the Premier League next season. Uh, I think that I think that that is a realistic ambition. So hopefully he can make it. And it's just because uh, Brighton will be in the Europa League, Will, and because there might be a little bit more opportunity, it is worth looking out to see if Andrew Moran can get, can poke his way into that team and get a little bit more experience. He, He's made his Premier League debut off the bench now, if, if I'm remembering rightly, his last season. He's a small guy, uh, but in terms of a creative attacking midfielder, he's he is very talented. Like he, he is a talent to be excited about if he can get the right opportunities. And with Brighton playing Thursday, Sunday, and with cup commitments as well this season, hopefully we'll see we'll see a bit of Andrew Moore as well. Oh, for sure. Look, I appreciate I'm not going to convince either you or Mick to get interested with me about the Community Shield final for this Sunday, but. I do wonder about the bigger picture of these two clubs going into the season because Bernardo Silva is now being heavily linked with a move away from Man City. Mares has already left. Gundogan is gone. Arsenal have put two hundred million into their squad already. Are Arsenal going to be even closer to City this season? You would hope. You would imagine that they will be. I mean, there's a real bang of Virgil Van Dijk signing for Liverpool off Declan Rice going to Arsenal, isn't it? I mean, they're tar- they, like, I mean, the manager targets this is the one player that we really need to get to close the gap, and he's backed and committing an absolutely enormous sum um, by the club to get their man. Uh, and plus, Van Dijk was seemingly targeted by Man City as well. There was some interesting uh, reports that oh, a City well, actually we might like a bit of Declan Rice actually now that Arsenal are interested in him, um, and then the the other recruit. Like Kai Havertz will come in and add a little bit more of an attacking dimension for for Granit Xhaka. The defence has massively been strengthened by adding Yuri and Timber. And um, they lacked, especially when the injuries bit last season, they lacked depth, didn't they? At, um, at centre back and even at right centre back, or sorry, at, at right full back as well, where Timber can play. So you'd imagine that Arsenal would close the gap. But I mean, we say this every year by Man, Man City. We look for reasons why we think um, the gap might close and will they miss? You know, they've so the uh, gundogan has gone. He's been such an important player for them. But Kovacic is a pretty serviceable replacement. Obviously, Mares is has gone but maybe maybe they're perhaps looking at Michael Elise at Crystal Palace whether they'll do that deal or not Uh, but they're about to sign Josko Vardial the Croatian defender um, from Leipzig who we probably all remember being turned inside out by Leo Messi Uh, in the semi-final of the World Cup but up to that point Vardial was the best defender of that World Cup he's a spectacular signing for them and he's only what 21 or 22 so again I mean listening to Jurgen Klopp during the week he was asked about uh, Liverpool's prospects and he basically said Man City can think about winning the league and no one else can it's Champions League for everyone else so um, Arsenal have massively committed and they've backed Arteta in a very significant way you would hope that that should help them close the gap that will certainly be their expectation but City are just so imperious and like it seems well every year every year we listen to Guardiola say how much he doesn't want to lose Bernardo Silva and Kyle Walker like these guys have seemingly been almost out of the club for the last three seasons uh, three summer transfer windows and they've never left Um Bernardo in particular would be a massive loss if he were to leave. Um, but unless they end up in Saudi Arabia, I don't really know where they're going to land. And that is just one of the wrinkles to look out for because, you know, we don't never know how the Premier League will shake out until the transfer window is closed. Uh, but the Saudi Pro League, their transfer window runs beyond the start of September. I'm not sure exactly when it closes. I think it's uh, three weeks, Jurgen Klopp was saying. It's it's almost a month, but it's definitely three weeks, which like, is particularly risky to some of these Premier League clubs if someone was to get unsettled. Right now, it probably suits them perfectly to sell for good dollar. But if hmm. Saudi teams come in with a massive offer when the transfer window is closed, there's three weeks of jeopardy there for the Premier League clubs. Yeah, so that's more imponderables. And now for the first time in a very long time, you know, Premier League clubs are vulnerable to mega bids from outside their league. We've seen like Liverpool have been, Liverpool seeming, were seemingly, uh, were kind of set to be kind of building nicely for this season. And all of a sudden their midfield has just been smithereened uh, with Fabinho and Henderson going. So they kind of, that midfield is now beginning to look in rag order again ahead of the season start. So the fact that this, 
this possibility will hang over clubs into you know into the end of September uh, is another little imponderable for the season. So maybe that's where the likes of Bernardo might end up yet, but it's hard to it's hard to see it. It's hard to see that happening. Interesting times ahead, Gavin. Thanks a million for joining us. Cheers, well. Football on off the ball with William Hill. Who you got? Eighteen plus. See gamblingcare.ie.